We're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. Americans approve of labor unions at the highest level since 1965. 71% of Americans now approve of labor unions, according to Gallup. That is what the figure was in 1965, the all-time high, at least since 1940, when uh, when Gallup began tracking it was uh went from 72 to 75 percent i think that was the all-time high in the early 1950s uh now it's back up to 71 percent what does that mean and what is going on with the uh with the uh trend toward unionization that we seem to be reading and hearing so much about and talking so much on this program here to help me sort all of that out is jonah Furman. jonah is a staff writer with labor notes that is available at labornotes.org and he joins us now so first of all jonah thanks for coming on the program yeah thanks for having me glad to be here Glad to have you. So what do you make of this 71% figure? You know, we have uh, such a divided electorate when it comes to left versus right and so on, but pretty widespread uh, support for unions. What's that about, you think? Uh, I mean, I think there's a ton of factors here, but one thing that it directly brings to mind when I saw that Gallup poll was we're also at the highest point of corporate profiteering since I forget what the number is 1955 economists have been measuring this basically how much money does it seem like corporations are making on top of what they're spending how much they're bringing in as pure profit so it's not an accident that corporations are taking the most money they've ever taken percentage wise and people are most looking to unions for a fix to that problem that's obviously uh connected I think there's more to it but I think that's sort of the bottom line for why people will want unions now is because that's the one tool we have in this country to close the uh the profit gap the wage gap the income gap yeah you know it's so interesting to me that it was at the highest when uh when wages and um profits were going up more or less in lockstep and then it was after uh after the 2008 recession went down to 48 percent i feel like you make a great point about corporate profiteering but i also feel as if for whatever reason and i'm curious to know your thoughts about it but it seems to me that not only are people upset and pissed off rightfully about corporate profiteering but it seems like now they feel like they can do something about it yeah i think that's right i mean i think one of the things we've seen over the past i don't know 10 years people call it polarization but it's also sort of the reinvigorating of political life from like occupy wall street to the black lives matter movement and on the right even from the tea party to trump like there's been actual political activity in this country in a way that if you remember back to the 2000s it kind of felt like nothing could be done we were talking about the end of history and you know parties were all centrist and there was no real right. so you know for better or worse people feel that uh political change is possible a lot of it is in the, the wrong direction but i think it sort of has a ripple effect for people who are trying to push back they say wow like the right wing can just sort of take over the country in the past 10 years why can't you know unions and pro class politics forces in this country uh you know take a little back so i think there is something to it where people feel like uh things clearly are not stable which means that they're not unchangeable they keep changing they get worse but maybe they right. can go the other direction right yeah, that's a great point jonah what do you think uh you've been covering several retail uh campaigns uh you at least you have uh you, you wrote recently about the first chipotle union i work with a guy who's a Tri chipotle addict he just loves everything they they put out um but you talked about uh, your articles how zoomers organized the first chipotle union you also have been writing about the progress on the traders trader joe's union of course we've seen uh, you know the starbucks uh unionization effort um and the retaliation to that um why do you think retail seems to be one of the livelier fronts for union activity that is a great question i mean i i think in the chipotle case in the starbucks case to some extent in in you know even in amazon and trader joe's there is a generational thing happening um and there is a sense of 
You know, it's funny, the places with the least union density, especially food service, are places where we're seeing breakthroughs. And to some extent, it's because there hasn't been any activity there organizing wise that people feel it's time for something new and independent. Like the Starbucks workers campaign is not independent. It's affiliated with the union, but it is sort of this bolt from the blue. We're not going to use old models, old structures. We're going to go on strike a lot more. We're going to file union elections at places that two years ago, you never would have thought to. There's sort of this idea that um, this is like untouched terrain. Uh, so I think workers there are not following any rule books that the union movement has had. And that combined with a really fertile ground for it, tight labor market, new young workforce, a lot of political polarization over the traumatic experience of the pandemic and a lot of other things. You know, I think, um, I think it's sort of like in more traditionally unionized industries, it feels like there's less movement available to the non-union breakthroughs and new organizations and things like that. Um, whereas in the very low, you know, food service is something like two to 3% unionized, way below the 10% of the national average in, in all industries. So um, I think people, you know, part of it is the feeling that something new is possible because nothing's been done and those jobs have been so bad for so long. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else what else it is. Part of it is that these are massive employers. I mean, you know, people don't realize that Starbucks is the ninth or 10th largest employer in the private sector in the country. Chipotle is not that big, but something in the top 100. Uh, we have these, these as I think it's overstated, but as the economy has moved more towards service, you've had these ballooning companies that haven't really been touched by legacy unions. That's not true in all cases. Hospitality has, of course, some unionization. There's, there's here and there, but... Um, you know, it's just like a under organized and growing sector. So if you threw a dartboard at the threw a dart at the dartboard of the economy, you're going to hit some service uh, employers like Starbucks is people don't quite realize how massive it is. Yeah, that's a great point. And when you think, Jonah Furman, about the fact that manufacturing has shrunk so much and manufacturing is more heavily unionized, you know, with leg legacy unions. So that's shrunk. Uh, service industries have grown. So it's this massive new virgin territory. But one other thing thing I've wondered about in all of this, and I, I'm a big supporter of unions, and I mean, you know, Richard Trumpka has been on the show. I, you know, we get, we, we will have, you know, we like unions around here and, you know, come from a union family and everything. But it does, I have wondered also whether, whether it's the Amazon Workers Union or some of the retail initiatives we've been talking about. I'm wondering too whether, uh, we're seeing a kind of ground up, maybe it's the anarchist in me or something, but it seems as if we're seeing this sort of self-organizing where people get together who maybe have not had exposure to traditional unions, but they're like, you know, this isn't right. We should do something about this. A more, uh, what's the word, a more grassroots, more spontaneous feel to it. Does that uh, make any sense to you at all? I think that's right. I mean, you know, one, another way to put it is that like, the the flagship campaigns we've seen the new organizing breakthroughs that have made headlines have not for the most part been the more traditional model of a union sets a target in their industry they go after the big fish um you know sometimes they get sorted into industries after the fact but you know for 15 years there was this ufcw union campaign to organize Walmart. This was like a traditional campaign where you take a target in your industry, especially the biggest target, and go after it. Even in the 30s, you know, for the most part, the organizing that happened, I mean, it was a mix, but there was certain industries like, you know, steel that were targeted by existing unions like the mine workers and said, this is a strategic target. We're going to go after the biggest employers. What we've seen here, I don't know if you know, spontaneous is part of it, but also sort of the workers are choosing what the targets are. Starbucks would never have mm -hmm. been a target for the labor movement um, two years ago. Uh, Amazon was a target, but sort of not, didn't seem realistic to most people. You know, Walmart has, no one even talks about anymore besides, aside from them being the largest employer in the private sector. So spontaneous, perhaps, it's been interesting to see the unions sort of adapt to it. You saw two Trader Joe's stores organize independently, and then the 
UFCW, the traditional grocery union, filed for a union election at Trader Joe's and is sort of trying to jump on the bandwagon, which is a good dynamic that we should see. But it's certainly not, you know, a union organizing director saying, here's the target. We're going to go out and get them right. and succeeding at that. And that model, I mean, you know, it's it's there's a lot of reasons it hasn't worked, but we have not seen really successful, proactive, targeted campaigns like that in many years. And, you know, I also wonder about workplace size and how this figures into all of that, right? Because, you know, I, I, there used to be a unionized presence in, in, in grocery chains and that kind of thing, uh, Safeway and Vons and whatever. But, but it, it seems to me, uh, well, you have the Amazon uh, you have the Amazon, you have thousands at an Amazon warehouse site. You have thousands of workers at Chipotle. You might have what a couple hundred at Starbucks. You might have several dozen. So it seems to me that these victories are almost they start out as messaging victories in a place like Starbucks, right? It can be done. Look, we just did it. And then from there, it goes on to become enough of a threat to Howard Schultz and the corporation that he starts to fight back. Maybe other unions get involved. Uh, is there a lesson in here about kind of symbolic or I don't know if that's the right word, but flagship organizing? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think there's there's a great essay written by um, my former coworker at Labor Notes, Chris Brooks, that basically talks about these two models of organizing, of structure based organizing and momentum based organizing. And the union movement forever has been structure based organizing. You build a committee, you build density slowly, you have a plan, you're executing the plan, um, and like that is going to have to be part of it to win a first contract. That seems to be where the Starbucks campaign is pivoting is like, let's look at some strategic cities. Where do we build enough density? But at the beginning, it's really this momentum model. That's like, you know, and there's people who have written books about this, but basically you're looking for a trigger event that's going to create a massive sort of spontaneous coming to the light, you know, like to the flame, all these people sort of see the bat signal and understand what their next step is. And then you're going to scoop that up into a structure. So in Starbucks, we saw, you know, I remember I talked to the Starbucks workers before their first election, and it was just a couple workers in Buffalo. And I was like, this is interesting. There's been some groups tried to organize Starbucks before. I don't expect it to go anywhere. They won their first election and suddenly they saw elections popping up in First, it was Arizona and then, you know, across the country, they made it so that the common sense for Starbucks workers who were unhappy with the status quo was to file for a union election. That's like the big shift that happened here is for people to say, oh, my next step is a union if my job is, uh -huh. is not, you know, is not working out for me, which was not has not been the common sense uh, of workers and still is not, I mean, still uh, your average American worker is more likely to quit their job than unionize it. But sort of this, this, at least at the beginning, this inspirational victory that can give people sort of a model. Here's what I could do. I think it is going to have to, you know, we're going to have to find this blended version of it that uses old school organizing tactics and union structure tactics to get things like a first contract to really, you know, mm -hmm. th they've done amazing work at Starbucks. They've organized 250 or so stores. There's 9,000 stores. They're not close to the amount of economic pressure on that basis alone that would force Howard Schultz to agree to a national contract or anything like that. So it'll be interesting to see sort of the reason I report on Chipotle and Trader Joe's and so excited about this is because you're sort of wondering are Chipotle workers going to see what just happened in Lansing and say, oh, that's my next step? It seems like in Trader Joe's, it's happened at a few stores. And, you know, we hear behind the scenes, there's a few more brewing. The question is, where is it going to become such common sense? And like you said, where is like sort of the franchise size, the demographic population uh, and the politics of the work for? I mean, sort of what are the factors here? But where is it possible to read an article on the internet, then go take it back to your workplace and do it the next day. Um, right. small, small places like 20 workers at Starbucks, it's possible. An 8,000 member warehouse, that obviously for ALU, the Amazon Labor Union, they have organized one, they're working on another in Albany. It's gonna be a different path if you have hundreds or thousands in a single facility. And I'm wondering, you know, different 
obviously different corporations respond differently. Uh, I, I, I don't know if Trader Joe's has been cooperating with the unionization process, have they? It's, it's interesting. They Their tack uh, has been basically to say, yes, we'll bargain with you immediately, bring out a legacy grocery union contract. And there's what's sort of the subtext there is that Trader Joe's is has avoided unionization for a long time by paying a little bit more. Obviously, you have fewer rights on the job, but you get more direct pay and benefits. So they, they want to say, basically, bring us a Safeway contract and we'll, we can bargain on that basis. The implicit thing being, we're going to lower your wages, you know? Right, right. Well, you know, because one of the reasons why I ask is because, you know, I read about the crappy things that uh, Starbucks is doing, you know, to they're really not playing along, shall we say. And I kind of wake up every morning saying, not really, but metaphorically saying, uh, are we boycotting Starbucks yet? Because I think there are a lot of like liberal latte drinkers who would kind of step up and say, no, you know, you can't write my name on another one of your cups uh, until you stop blocking the unionization effort. But I don't see uh, maybe it's just my own awareness, but I don't see that link. I mean, I I remember when, you know, people were boycotting Safeway and grapes because of, you know, the farm workers union. I don't see that sort of broader solidarity yet coming in to help these union in initiatives. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, I think we should remember that, like, you know, this has been a really short timeline. It was just a year ago that they filed for their first election in Buffalo. And I think, I, I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it went in that direction. The Starbucks campaign is making a very public call for supporters to sign up in their, they do these things called sip-ins. They're doing a big, uh, a big number of actions this weekend for Labor Day at different unionized stores around the country. So they definitely are doing some mobilization. But I also think, um, you know, part of what we're missing on this is first, it's going to take some time. The workers need to get more organized before they can sort of squeeze the company in that way to have it and have it be effective. You know, right now they're closing unionized stores. They're, you know, they're very right. aggressively hitting, hitting these workers. Um, one thing I think about is, you know, the Democratic Party and other sort of leaders of the so-called progressive whatever is, it's like we're not quite there yet where we have consensus of people saying this is unacceptable. Howard Schultz is behaving badly, like clearly. Right. We haven't had like congressional hearings of Howard Schultz coming. Tell us why you're doing this illegal activity. I think we might get there, um, but we, we're sort of still in the buildup phase where people are learning about this campaign. The union itself needs to grow a little bit before it can double down in that way. But I, I will say, you know, for people listening, there are definitely ways to get involved. You should check out the website um, and sign up to be a supporter in your area. Which but, website? Um, let me find out exactly what it is. It's the Starbucks Workers United website. You can also see on- um, Just Google SB, Starbucks Workers United or something. Yeah, sbworkersunited.org. Yeah, right. Well, they, they have it right there. Um, and they have this uh, no contract, no coffee pledge that's essentially saying, if you're a public supporter, get on our list so we can mobilize you to the picket lines. I mean, they've struck something like 60 stores already, and there will be more of that activity. So I think one of the main things is just making sure that the stores that do organize feel, you know, have the support of the community where there is like a shutdown or a picket line that it gets honored, that it doesn't just go to the next store that's 50 feet over, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> but it's a huge, I mean, you know, they're just taking on a giant... No, they definitely are, which is what I, I kind of love about what they're doing. You know, there's another dimension of this, Jonah Furman, that I wanted to talk to you about, and that's the generational, uh, you know, kind of generational wave of it. And like, by way of set up, like many years ago, I had a girlfriend who worked at a boutique, right? And they wanted to unionize. This was when, and the Teamsters came out and they were in you know, these like guys in suits in their fifties and these young women. And, and he was like, the guys were like, you girls, you know, took them to a, a coffee shop. You girls, here's what we can do for you. And so in other words, what I'm saying is for a long time, there was a generational gap between traditional union leaders and the whole concept of unions 
and younger people, right? And younger people who are often in the jobs where they most need a union, you know, uh, lowest paid and so on. It, it, it seems to me that one of the big trends, and I'm not the first person to say this, I'm, you know, I know, but whether it's Amazon labor union, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, what's going on at Starbucks, whether it's a lot of things going on in my, my field of media and so on, it seems to me that a lot of it has a new energy and a different kind of energy coming, uh, you know, I'm not at all ageist, and I, I think people use generations to distract us from class warfare, but that said, that I do think that there's a, uh, a generational energy at work and people of all ages can support it. But do, do you get what I'm driving at? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like I said before, I think part of this is just a new political terrain that young people are coming into consciousness with, you know, they don't, they don't have, they have strong ideas about um, what's possible in politics and how much conflict is involved in politics so that you know, I think in the 90s and 2000s, there was a sense that if you talk too much about class war or too much, you know, class conflict with your boss, you're sort of breaking, you're, you're, you're disrupting the peace we've found. And I think especially the, the Zoomers, you know, talking to them for this Chipotle story, it was all organized by people who are under 25 years old. There's no, there was no sort of question of, of which sides are involved in this. Um, you know, there's, the big corporations and there's the managers and then there's the workers and often that's polarized along age lines in these contexts as well um so i think it's definitely i mean one thing it makes me think about is uh you know in the movie goodfellas came out in 1990 there's this joke it's like a throwaway line where he's like talking to his date and he says i'm in construction and she's like your hands are so soft and he's like i'm a union rep and i think about oh, how yeah. that joke wouldn't even make sense to zoomers today because there's very like unions have in their disappearing they've also sort of lost their identity good or bad for people and now it's sort of pure unadulterated rights at work people are finding so all these cultural hang-ups people had about the hard hat riots or you know george meany things that people of e even my age still are aware of and connect with i think younger people especially are just like no the union is the thing that fights the boss uh you know i know the teamsters sometimes go on strike i saw the teachers go on strike you know, when i yeah, was in high bet. school and yeah. that's it you know that's so I don't know. I just think we've sort of, for better or worse, with 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 the disappearance of unions from a lot of people's daily life, it also means that any baggage there was about this is for someone else has sort of cleared away. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. You know, I was beaten up by hard hats as a high school hippie protester, but uh, not, not there was a famous uh, riot. I wasn't there for that, but you know, they also branched out and did some individual work. But I think I feel as if one of the uh, big propaganda wins of the 60s and 70s was that people sort of said, well, you know, they're big bosses and big union bosses. You know, like they're the same, they're equivalent. And there was this generation gap uh, and so on that began to develop over time. And George Meany and, you know, some of those figures in union history. This is why I think this is, I think it's a fantastic time for for uh, labor organizing. I think we desperately need it one thing i'll bring it up but if you don't have anything to say about it just tell me and we'll move on but i've been fascinated by and p reflecting on and planning to write about is so-called quiet quitting right this whole phenomenon that says hey you pay me for eight hours i'm gonna work for eight hours uh uh, and you pay me to do X, Y, and Z, I'll do X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z, and one, two, three, unless you pay me for one, two, three. This is, this is how I understand quiet quitting. And um, is that a real thing, you think? Is, or is it more of just a media creation? Do you have any thoughts on that? As to whether it's actually happening, I mean, that's, I don't know. That's like for the sociologists. But I will say, like, I think it's real. I think the unions would call it work to rule, you know, like that's your your contract, your agreement with your employer. I think it's an interesting echo from about a year ago with the Great Resignation, which was happening at the same right. time as, you know, the striketober. And how I was talking about it, those two phenomena at the time was they're two sides of the same coin. Either you're going to quit your job as an individual, and it's going to be the great resignation, or you're going to go on strike, stay and fight to improve it. I think the quiet quitting thing is the same thing. People, 
it, I think part of what it's expressing is that our culture has such corporate media, of course, has an aversion to it, but also our culture has so little vocabulary for collective uh-huh. class action, you know, like, so they're like, how do I describe, uh, you know, my daily sorts of protests against my corporate overlords? We don't talk about it in terms of class terms. We talk about it in terms of individual uh, behavior, but I think it's the same. Um, you know, I, I'd be curious to see if like, we are at a higher rate of absenteeism and things that economists measure um, that went up, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when we saw sort of an, a similar thing where the culture, the young workers were changing, and you saw a lot of strikes, but you also just saw a lot of absenteeism, quitting, you know, moving around to different jobs, a different relationship to work. So I, I think it's probably a real phenomenon. I think it's funny that we jump through hoops to invent new words for what is basically just the daily class warfare fair of having a job in this country. Yeah, that's a great perspective. The other thing is, and, and and it's interesting to me that we invent a word for doing what you're paid to do. <laughs> yes. And not more than what, you know, and I, I, I was raised with the ethos, work ethic, you know, do a dollar's worth of work for 50 cents worth of pay and all that stuff. But really at this point, you're just giving away the resource they're underpaying you for. This is why, you know, if it's a real thing, I, I, you know, I'm for it. You want me to do more, pay me more. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not like the corporations of America are saying, uh, Jonah, here's another 500 bucks just because we like your face or, you know, because we're ambitious. We're going to give you more money. You know, it's like, no, you give me what you agree to agree. I do what you agreed I would do for that money. But it, it does, it is a, culture shift isn't it yeah i think the way we're talking about it is you know it's is different i also think that it's funny people talk about the new gilded age i think the most similar thing is that they forget that unions and most workers rights legislation was a brokered piece that was for both sides it was to make you know like we had efficiency and productivity rise with wages and while that deal you know the new deal was a deal the deal was <laughs> we're going to have labor peace as long as we get, you know, some basic welfare state, basic wage increases, things like that. And the deal was bro- broken. And it's not just bad for the workers. I mean, it is bad for the workers, but it's also bad for the society and it's bad for the corporations. It might be good for the next two years, five years. But, you know, if you have if it's true that you're having rates of absenteeism and quitting at this level, like this is not the point of government under capitalism is to stabilize the markets, you know, stabilize capitalism so it can survive its own worst instincts. Uh, and we're currently at a, a flux point where it's, it has not restabilized, uh, you know, it may be that it's like rust. You you know, you can't contain it on your, on your car's auto body, no matter how many times you paint over it, the, Russ is going to, you know, but okay, last question for you. And I, I appreciate you bearing with me on all of this. I'm really enjoying it. But uh, optimism level, what's your optimism level for the future or, you know, expectations? Or are you just taking it a day at a time? Uh, you know, I'm someone who I really think it's important for us to be understand where we're at. We are at a historic low of working class organization and activity. We're a little better than we were five years ago. Um, We're really close to the bottom. This is something like the 1920s. Now, the thing that gives me optimism is we, the hardest thing to change about working class politics is consciousness. It's this fuzzy thing that we don't know how, how to measure it. We don't know how to influence it exactly. Inspiration, what makes workers want to organize or, you know, things like that. And I, I know, you know, we can definitely say that more workers want to organize now than did two years ago. And I think the question I'm looking at in terms of how to feel about the next five, 10 years in worker organizing is can the inspiration of new organizing, like the formation of Starbucks Workers United, can we turn this into gains that can continue to inspire? You're really going to be cooking with fire when you have workers winning. Um, There's a huge 
there's a huge difference between taking a first inspirational step and having your first inspirational victory. And that's sort of the question. We have a couple years here where it's okay if the Amazon effort is building slowly and has some setbacks right. and if Howard Schultz is closing stores and firing workers, that can that can fuel the fire for a while, but it will flame out if there's not some breakthrough, some something we can point to and say, look, put it all on the line and you could come back with this. Um, so to say I'm an optimist, no, I don't, you know, I just don't think like that. I don't think, but I do think that um, if you look at some of the numbers, we are in a better place than we were a few years ago. And I, I think undeniably the level of awareness and consciousness around people's rights at work and unions and organization as an answer to the trouble that we face, uh, you know, it's up and it makes me feel good when I run into strangers, you know, talk to people, uh, in public who are not union people who don't follow this stuff religiously. And they know that something's happening at Amazon. Something's happening at Starbucks. Things are, you know, there are strikes. John Deere goes on strike. These things matter. Um, and it's been good to see, uh, something to point to and say that's the union movement and that's what we can do well we'll leave it there for now but jonah Furman, to read jonah's work uh labornotes.org right it's dot org mm -hmm. and, and um to uh, i recommend everyone to do that and to stay conscious of uh the workers organizing movement in this country it's it's hopefully uh, a big wave of our future so jonah thanks for all the great reporting and uh thanks for coming on the program yeah thanks for having me thanks for coming it yeah it was a pleasure and we'll be right back after this i'm richard rj escow and this is the zero hour